So uh, let's start off with, um, I mean, most everybody that's in this conversation would know who you are, but yeah. why don't you start out with just a little um, introduction of who you are and uh, what your, your mission is here at now. Perfect. So I have trained as a neuropsychologist, which is a PhD in clinical psychology, specialty training in neuropsychology, but I trained across several different age groups. I trained in pediatric neuropsychology, I trained in lifespan neuropsychology, and I trained in geriatric, older age neuropsychology. I also trained in functional brain neuroimaging, which means fMRI. Uh, back in the day before we had fMRI, we have a paper on SPECT scanning, which is a SPECT study, which is an earlier version of brain imaging. And then the lab I worked in also did diffusion tensor imaging, which is measuring just the white matter fiber, white matter fibers in the brain that connect the parts of the brain that really are the communication systems of how the brain works together. And then also trained in neurorehabilitation. So there's developmental disorders like dyslexia that are genetic. And so we call it dyslexia, which goes along with the genetic basis. There's also a reading problem that's literally probably about a hundred times more severe to improve than dyslexia, and it's called phonological alexia. And one group says we call it an alexia because it's an acquired disorder, meaning it's due to brain injury, like a stroke. And I spent 10 years doing studies, research, publications to show that we're about 70% successful rebuilding phonological skills, reading skills, speaking skills, and even spelling skills after brain injury using the same developmental approach that we use to help empower children, teens, and adults um, working on uh, empowering their dyslexia. Awesome. So um, the, the purpose of this uh, Facebook Live is to really uh, just get out there and answer some, some questions, try to dispel some, some myths. So I'm gonna throw some, uh, mm -hmm. some myths that we hear all the time about dyslexia yeah is dyslexia an eye problem well they used to think dyslexia was vision because they noticed that some kids were looking at was and saying saw or they looked at top and they said pot and like oh they're seeing the words backwards so there's some concern that they really were struggling and most all parents um, or even adults who have dyslexia um, which by the way that includes you and me um, would mix up B's and D's early on before they'd had full remediation. And the question was, are they seeing the letters backwards? Are they seeing the words backwards? But what they began to realize is, okay, if you saw pot backwards, and that's why you said top, then you would have to see the backwards too, and we'd expect you to say et. Um, but, you know, they don't. People with dyslexia don't read words backwards. Otherwise, they would read every word backwards more likely is they're just flipping a few words around because they're reading by one system, which is the ability to memorize words like sight words, words that you can't sound out like yacht, though, um, you know, somewhere, those are not phonetic words. And the best chance you have of learning them, is you just have to memorize them as a whole word with a sound structure that goes with the word. So there are studies that show some differences in visual processing. There are some kids who can have co-occurring visual processing inefficiencies, like visual perceptual skills that aren't as strong, or depth perception that's not as strong, or convergence that's not as strong, or they struggle to copy from the board down to paper, which has a visual component, but a motor component too. And those can be co-occurring, but they're not looked upon, nor does the research support that those are actually causal factors that are causing the reading problems. So consequently, there's a white paper, I think it was 2009 and again in 2014, where both the American Academy of Pediatrics and I believe it was uh, the Association, the National Association of Ophthalmologists, the MD eye doctors, um, came out and said, there's no justification for vision therapy for reading problems. Um, if you're losing your place and you're skipping words, that's not necessarily causing the reading problems, except for you're losing your place. It's not really affecting your ability to sound out words. It's not affecting your ability to recognize words one at a time by sight. So long answer is um, it's 
a piece of the puzzle. It's something to look into. Short answer is vision problems don't cause the reading problems that we know as dyslexia. Okay. So one of the things that we deal with a lot of in, in the public school system is most children um, that have dyslexia aren't identified until late third grade, if not further on. And there was, there's been um, messaging out in the, in the school districts that you can't identify, diagnose dyslexia until after third grade. What's your thoughts on that? Well, the DSM-5, or what's called the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, is the Bible of diagnoses that licensed healthcare providers are supposed to follow. And the DSM-5 only has three criteria for diagnosing dyslexia. And this will upset some people. It will clarify it for others. But hold on. Before you get upset by this, we'll explain more. But the DSM-5 just says there's either struggles with reading accuracy or struggles with reading fluency, reading speed, or struggles with reading comprehension. Any one of those three are enough of a criteria to diagnose dyslexia. And you can have one of the three, two of the three, or three of the three, and that's all that's required. There's not an age listed in the DSM-5 at which time can you formally diagnose, because in different countries or in different parts of the world, we know that kids get exposure to letters at different times. So if a child is, you know, four and they've had two years of exposure to letters and reading, we would expect some reading skills to develop by age six. So they've had, you know, at least two years of exposure to letters and sounds and reading skills because maybe they're in a program that's very advanced towards literacy, early literacy development. Um, so in that case, that child could be diagnosed at age six. You know, other kids might get diagnosed at age five. It depends on what level of opportunity and degree of instruction and practice they've had. But a caveat that goes along with that is we can early identify the risk factors that we know predict who's most likely to struggle to learn to read and spell. And in that situation, then um, they are more likely to have um, an end diagnosis of dyslexia. And in those studies, they measured about, I don't know, 20 skills at age five, repeated those same skills at age six, same kids, brought those same kids back and measured age seven, and then age eight, and then age nine. And the question was, is there one or several tests at age five that predicts your reading skills at age nine? And the answer was, yeah, one test of the whole battery was the most specific and sensitive to predicting who showed up as being diagnosed with reading disorders at age nine. And that was a test called phoneme elision which is a measure of a speech processing skill, it has nothing to do with letters, has nothing to do with what you see, it has everything to do with how well you can perceive sounds and words, manipulate those sounds and words, and make changes to them. And that's that definition of phonological awareness. That's your ability to hold on to sounds or words, split them apart, judge a deletion, or judge an addition where you go from four sounds to five sounds, make a judgment about those manipulations. So. Dyslexia has three criteria, and many people want to say, yeah, but there's more to dyslexia than that. There can be other co-occurring difficulties, but those actually are not under the umbrella diagnostic term of dyslexia. You could have a sensory processing disorder or motor coordination disorder, and that accounts for some of the visual motor trouble you have. That's not part of dyslexia's diagnosis. You know, you could have visual perceptual skill deficits, and that would be separate from the dyslexia, but the OTs have specific tests they can use to measure visual perceptual, visual memory, uh, visual figure ground, visual motor skills. So those are other difficulties that some students do have, some adults do have, um, some kids do have, but others don't. And again, the key piece is they're not part of the diagnosis of just that diagnostic term of specific learning disorder with impairment in reading, which is synonymous with the term dyslexia. And I have to throw in, Stephen, because I see this on Facebook a lot now, is well-intentioned people will say, yeah, but there's no um, word dyslexia in the DSM-5 anymore. And I'm like, no, actually there is. You know, in that diagnostic category of specific learning disorder with impairment of reading, at the bottom it has a little box that says 
commonly also known as dyslexia, and it goes on to say some more things about it. So DSM-5 does list the word dyslexia. It fits it under a diagnostic category, and it parallels it with the broader diagnosis of specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. That's a long answer to your question. So, well, let, let's let's let that caveat into uh, the next question. And I know that that we hear this a lot. That dyslexia is a lifelong disability, or you'll have some some people that want to call it a a, a learning style or a learning uh, um, difference. Yeah, yeah, learning difference is getting to be really common. So. Can you, and I'm using air quotes here, <laughs> can you fix, cure, remediate? Um, and I know all three of those words mean something completely different. And I'm doing it specifically for this. I'm doing this. I want to know, can you take a, a person, a child that has dyslexia and then make them look as if they don't have dyslexia? Very powerful question. A little complicated in how it's answered. So let me back up and just say, let's review. There's three criteria for a diagnosis of dyslexia. Reading accuracy, reading fluency, and reading comprehension. And this is based on the DSM-5. That is for professionals who are actually licensed to diagnose it. That's the criteria you're gonna use. So, so let's cover those again. What, what, yeah. what three are they? It's reading accuracy has to be impaired. Okay. So or, what, is that, what does that look like for our parents to understand? Okay. What does reading accuracy look like? It means you're not making lots of mistakes when you're reading words. You're able to both sound them out and you're able to remember and memorize sight words. Both systems are working equally strong. And the professionals will use standardized testing of how many sight words do you know compared to kids your age? And that's what the Wilcock Johnson does or the WIAT does or the Pfeiffer does or the WRMTR, you know, any of these tests that are actually measures of what they call word identification, which is means your ability to memorize and read words that cannot be sounded out. Okay. But the other part of accuracy is, can you sound out words? And this is a hallmark deficit with one of the main characteristics of children who fit into and adults and teens who don't get remediation fit into that criteria of dyslexia or reading accuracy problems is they're not accurate at sounding out words. They'll make one of five mistakes and how professionals, meaning clinical psychologists, neuropsychologists, speech therapists who are all licensed to diagnose dyslexia, how they will measure it is they will give you a test of words to read that are words you've never seen before and they're actually not even real. And by that, it means they don't have any meaning associated with them. But they do follow all of the conventions of typical English words. So they could be an English word, but they aren't. So they don't have consonants together that don't happen in real words. They don't have vowels combined in ways that don't happen in real English words. So they're what they call pseudo words or nonsense words because it solely measures your ability to sound out a word. So they might have to look at a word and go snoisk, snoisk. What's a snoisk? Who knows? It's nothing. But did you sound out all the letters accurately? And did you produce all the sounds when you blended the sounds together? That is the act of reading. And so the individual who has dyslexia will most likely make one of five mistakes when they read. They'll add a sound that doesn't belong. So they might look at snoisk and say snoisked. And they added another sound at the end when there wasn't a t at the end of the word. Um, they might delete a sound that's supposed to be there. So they might look at snoise and say, you know, snoise and leave off the k. Or they might reverse two sounds. They might look at snoisk and say snoik, snoiks. And they've now reversed the last two sounds at the end. They might also repeat a sound that twice it's only supposed to be in the word once. Um, or they might substitute one sound for the other. They might look at snoisk and say smoisk and put a m sound where there's supposed to be a n sound because the letter in the word is an n, not an m. And so those are ways that we looked for accuracy in both reading individual sight words and accuracy in actually being able to sound out words. The other factor is reading fluency, which means as you're reading along a paragraph, 
how many words are you reading per minute um, and what's your speed of reading. Um, and there's different tests that measure that. Some tests measure fluency only by itself with nothing else. Some tests like the GORT-5 or the Gray Oral Reading Test number five, it measures your fluency and your accuracy and your comprehension all combined together. And we're just looking to see, is your speed of reading on par with individuals typical of your age with the years of educational experience you have had? Third part is reading comprehension. Can you read a paragraph and then answer questions that actually are accurate because you understood what the paragraph talked about? Or do you read a paragraph and you're just guessing? You have little, little to no understanding a recollection of what the story talked about. Some stories ask you just to answer questions. Some stories ask you to verbally retell it back to the examiner. Um, other stories ask just verbatim questions. What was the boy's name in the story? And you have to say, oh, that was Bob. You know, other stories say, you know, higher reasoning questions like prediction, deduction, inference, conclusion. The story didn't really say, but they're asking you to think about the information and tell us what do you think might happen next, which is most likely, option A, B, or C. So there's different ways they actually might test comprehension. And again, that gives us a way to measure those three skills that are hallmarks of dyslexia. So the question was, do you ever um, cure dyslexia? Does it ever go away? Would there be a time when you actually don't meet that diagnostic criteria? And let me specify the two pieces. One, we know dyslexia is genetic. So it's a, a genetic predisposition, which means an increased likelihood that this left side of the brain that is really most likely wired for the phonological processing. And as you get spoken to as a child at birth and you keep getting spoken to up to age four, typically your phonological processor is building from several sensory systems. It's not just acoustic. Educators have finally begun to realize that just doing acoustic only auditory activities is not really going to change your phonological processing much because that's not how the brain typically builds phonological awareness. It builds it from acoustic and from visual and from sensory information about what's happening with your mouth. So understanding how those parts come together, if you get assessed and you don't have a reading accuracy deficit, it's actually on par with your greater IQ level, and your fluency now is on par with your greater IQ level, and your reading comprehension is on par with your greater IQ level, depends on what we're comparing it to, then scientifically and methodically with how the DSM-5 works, that professional cannot give you the diagnosis of dyslexia. They could say by history you've had it, but you currently don't show the behaviors that are required to be diagnosed with it. Genetically, are your kids more likely to have it? Yeah, absolutely, because we didn't do any gene therapy when someone successfully remediated dyslexia. So we have many, many examples of individuals <clears throat> being improved so much they no longer meet the DSM-5 criteria, and that diagnosis has to be removed from a, a diagnostic assessment by a speech therapist who's licensed to diagnose dyslexia, removed by a clinical psychologist, a neuropsychologist, who's licensed to diagnose dyslexia. And I keep really emphasizing that because many times parents are getting information from the school that typically there's nobody in the school is even licensed to diagnose. So they use these sidebar terms that someone has made up like characteristics of dyslexia. Well, that doesn't mean anything because that's not the diagnosis and the person talking about it isn't licensed to diagnose it anyway. So hard for many families to understand because most adults with dyslexia, especially my age in the 50s or your age in the 40s, you know, they never really got rid of their reading problems. So in their personal experience, dyslexia never went away. Other adults or other individuals got remediation um, at age seven and they don't struggle and they no longer meet criteria. For example, you know, in your case and you know, situation, you got remediation at age 45. Odds are we have you retested. You're not going to meet criteria any longer because your accuracy, your fluency and your comprehension are now, you know, average or above average closer to your IQ level. So, so, so you ruined you ruined my next question. <laughs> my lead into my next question. So my next question was going to be, uh, you know, we also hear that if you remediate sooner, yeah, it's a lot easier to remediate dyslexia than if you wait until you're old like me and going mm -hmm. through the program 
after everything has settled in and taken a hold. Yeah. So can you can you remediate an, an adult dyslexic just as easy and or as you know in the same time frame, I guess I should yeah. say, yeah. as a a younger child it, that's in the school? There's several um, defining variables that will affect how that question is answered. Um, age by itself is just one variable. Um, neuroplasticity of the brain is lifelong. At any age, you can rewire the brain. Um, so let me let me stop you right there real quick. So a lot of people won't understand what neuroplasticity means. Good. So can you can you talk a little bit about what that means and why that statement is so important? Yeah, neuroplasticity is basically just the neuroscience term for can you learn something? And there's no point in your life when your brain has lost the, the ability to learn something unless you've had some type of neurological injury or disease process. Yeah, those things will affect learning. But just a typical healthy person is getting older. The brain maintains the ability to learn new things. And neuroscientifically, how the brain does it is it's making new connections between parts of the white matter and changing how it's interacting with cells in the gray matter. And those new connections are what we call new pathways. New pathways are the physical evidence of the brain building new skills, building new so, abilities. So hold on a second. You're actually telling me that you can see through fMRI, through whatever, the new pathways of we're actually, when people are saying you're rewiring the brain, yeah, you're, literally making new pathways and rewiring the brain. Exactly. Is that what you're is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's a special type of imaging. It's not fMRI. fMRI just measures where the blood's at in the brain and that tells us if there's a lot of blood on the left side, that's like the brain there's asking for fuel and the blood has to bring the fuel which is oxygen. So you can find the blood with oxygen versus this side there's blood but not much oxygen. So then this side's doing more work. So fMRI just looks about where is the activity at on the outside. DTI or diffusion tensor imaging, it's an amazing uh, technology. And for those who are math geeks, they know that tensor math is a type of mathematics. It measures flows across planes, like a horizontal plane or a vertical plane. Well, with DTI, you can use the MRI machine and some different software to measure which way are water molecules moving on the fibers, which are the white matter phone lines per se, I can't say that to younger kids because like, what's phone lines? I'm like, well, long ago, phones were connected by wires. But anyway, they can measure those white matter fibers as water moves across the fibers. Well, in one little itty bitty millimeter cubed of brain tissue, that technology can measure water moving in 56 different directions. And that's how we get these really fascinating colorized pictures of they change the color based on the angle of the fibers. And some fibers are going from the frontal lobe, reasoning part of the brain, back to the vision part of the brain. Some fibers are going from the frontal lobes over to the left side of the auditory cortex. Or they're going back here to part of the you know, visual perceptual system. Or they're going over here to the motor strip. You know, or there's parts of the parietal lobe that's connected to the temporal lobe. So you have all these fiber pathways. And yes, the fusion tensor imaging can measure that. And there have already been studies done that look at before intervention and after intervention, did the fiber pathways change? And there's one big fiber pathway that runs along the temporal lobe over here that's a real big language pathway called the arcuate fasciculus. And they've measured the arcuate fasciculus and shown it's changed in size after intervention. And so we think now the brain has built more fiber connections between the motor control of the mouth, the acoustic part here, as the brain has shown improvement on standardized testing for like phonological awareness. So yes, they can measure it. We measure it really, you know, scientifically, but understand too, those scientific methodologies are still very much research-based and different laboratories use different algorithms. Different laboratories use different, you know, statistical cutoffs about how you decide, is it, act, you know, is it a fiber pathway or not? So there's still work to actually get this to become to a clinical services level, but it certainly is very, very powerful on a research level that the brain can make new connections. So your question was back to, is the adult brain harder, easier to make connections and remediate dyslexia than a child's brain? Um, think of it this way too, besides age, another factor is severity. 
who has the more severe deficits. Um, you can actually have an eight-year-old who's more severely impaired in their reading skills than a 48-year-old because the eight-year-old is extremely impaired and barely knows their letters and sounds, and they really can't sound down any words, and they're not learning sight words as well. Well, that's a much bigger number of skills you have to retrain than maybe you got a 48-year-old who reads at the 30th percentile, but their IQ is at the 70th percentile. So they've got some reading skills, but they say, yeah, but I'm a slow reader, and I make mistakes from time to time, and yeah, I spell worse than I read. Um, they may actually have a smaller gap to close because they don't have as much of a severe deficit. So severity plus age plus other co-occurring factors will affect how easy or how many hours it takes. And does it take more than just like an evidence pro evidence based program, like that now foundations program that the now company has, you know, branded and makes available. Um, how many hours is it going to take? It depends on multiple factors. Is there other deficits like visual motor skill deficits where they can't copy from the board down to paper? Then we're going to need to do some OT in addition to the reading intervention of that now foundations program to get this person fully functional, either in the academic world or it could be an adult who's 40 who has struggles copying from the LCD screen down to paper. And they actually still are not too old to do occupational therapy from a sensory integration approach to try to change and enhance and strengthen the visual perceptual skills, visual memory skills, motor skill control, and the two together, which are required for looking at the board, holding the memory, and reproducing down on paper. I always hated that in school. I would <laughs> sit there and I would see the word, I'd, I'd know what the word is, and I'd start to write it down, and I'd have to look back up, make sure I'm spelling it right. It was just, it was always such a chore in school to take notes. Yeah. So, um, especially the spelling problem on top of that. And, and, we, and we both know that your wife says that she used to correct all of your spelling. Uh, she knew that she reviewed it for you ahead of time. You knew that you couldn't trust your own spelling and you're a man in your forties, perfectly bright, intelligent, but that system wasn't developing just because you got older. One analogy I love to give people and they say, well, yeah, but you know, these things change over time. I'm like you're suggesting that age by itself, just days passing on the calendar clock, somehow have changed your brain's function. And this is really important for parents of younger kids because some schools and some educators or some principals who are well-intentioned typically, and they're just speaking from their own you know, professional experience, will say things like, well, you know what? It just hasn't clicked yet. They need another year for the brain to mature and then it'll click because some kids click later for reading and spelling and other kids click younger. And we just need to give her another year of the same practice. And I say that because that was my experience as a parent. My own school didn't really understand my background as a brain scientist, a neuropsychologist, published researcher, I'm dyslexic myself, but I got early intervention at age five, um, all those factors. And so I had to explain to the principal and to the first grade teacher, getting older doesn't really change the brain's function. So if that was true, then we'd say, all men age 50 are perfectly mature because they've lived long enough. Now they're mature and they don't have, you know, silly behaviors or, you know, irresponsible behaviors or insensitive behaviors. And many people will tell you that that's just not true. You know, and I know many 50 year olds are completely irresponsible. They're not mature. They don't function well in life. And age did not give them those skills. So the brain builds skills in one neuroscientific way. It's called experience dependent neuroplasticity. It means if you don't give the brain the right experiences, and there's several elements that go along with this, it's experiences plus frequency of instruction, experiences plus intensity of instruction. The experience plus is it very um, specific instruction and are the experiences or the instruction in a developmental hierarchy from basic skills first to mid-level skills to advanced skills and are all these things happening? The intensity, the frequency, the specificity, the neurodevelopmental hierarchy, are they happening long enough for a long enough duration that the brain really has built um, wiring that's going to stay for a long time? It's kind of like saying if we gave you one bike riding lesson and then you never saw a bike again for 10 years, you probably aren't going to have any bike skills left. But if you gave you a week of bike riding lessons and you rode your bike at age six, seven, eight, and you spent years riding your bike and you take a 20-year hiatus from bike riding, well, those skills are so well wired that that network was so well built, it didn't just go away. It's most likely still there. Might be a little rusty, 
but you built it so strong that the brain doesn't typically just like completely obliterate unused networks. Um, but you did it for enough duration that you built that network that will last. And once you get back on the bike and start, re, you know, riding again, you'll feel it starts to come back faster and faster each day. So we have a, a true difference from what I like to call dystichia <laughs> and dyslexia. Yeah. So, you know, we, we hear that, that thought process a lot mm -hmm. in public schools that, you know, the, the kid just didn't, you know, like you said, they just didn't click or they just need more time or they yeah. need this. However, what we, what we know is that if the brain wiring, as we said, we're rewiring the brain, if the, mm -hmm. the wiring isn't either, you can say is, isn't there, or we can say isn't efficient. And this goes along with uh, our strengths and weaknesses model, right? So we're not saying that you don't have the ability to read. We're saying that you're wiring the way that it is, is, efficient, is inefficient, mm -hmm. and you're not able to uh, read and comprehend. Uh, and it even goes back to the fluency as we were talking about, being able to hold on to that information after we've read uh, the passage and be able to answer the questions. Right. So that's the reason why when we start talking about uh, rebuilding uh, the language portion of the brain, we're talking about making sure that we're we're not providing splintered skills, yeah. meaning we're not starting from the second floor when we're building this house. We got to go all the way back to ground floor, make sure that our foundational skills are completely uh, intact before right. we start moving forward. And that's the reason why we have dyslexia remediation programs in schools. Mm -hmm. However, what we find a lot of times is they tend to start trying to build from the second floor up. Yeah. A way we like yeah. to say is they're, they're the print up programs that try to also go down to speech processing, which is the reverse of the developmental model of how the brain actually learns language skills. All language skills in most every language are speak, spoken, speech processing skills first. That's the foundation. You speak and listen. Well, I should say you listen to speech for you know about a year or so, and then you start speaking as you're listening. And that input speech system and output speech system typically builds for about four years, depends on which country you live in. But in the US, about four or five years before we teach you the letters of that language. So now foundations as a neurodevelopmental multi-sensory treatment program, it was built from the model of how does the brain typically build full logical awareness before it gets to print so that it's actually easier and more efficient in actually building all these sounding out skills and sight word skills. And it helps that analogy of explanation of developmental hierarchy helps many parents understand why OG programs, which are all print first, speech later on, or print plus speech, they're never the phonological neurology of phonological processing with no letters first, and then go to print. They're typically far less effective, and, and they don't have randomized controlled trials. We're actually not even sure how effective they are without the randomized controlled trials that Dr. Sally Shaywitz says every dyslexia program must be vetted by randomized controlled trials because that's when you compare one treatment to a second treatment to a third treatment with a group to figure out what's the one that's the most effective that gives us the largest number of students improving, the largest amounts, and the best long-term outcomes. So it's trying to understand those developmental hierarchies, how they fit into our treatment program models as well. So in your, um, in your experience, how long do you do you feel? I know that this is a how long is a piece of string question, <laughs> and we all ask this. Uh, well, how long is it going to take? Yeah, and I know it takes as long as it takes, but in public school, we're seeing that it takes anywhere from three to ten years in yeah. remediation. I mean, I know I never talk to families or yeah. or never. Uh, and it gets to the point where um, I was in life with this is as good as it's going to get. Right. There's no reason to continue down this path. Uh, I'm just going to do whatever I can to, 
to mitigate the um, the 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 pain of being in school. So, in your professional opinion, when you're when you're looking at this, how long does it should it normally take to go through a dyslexia program that is developmentally uh, built, developmentally appropriate? From a scientific perspective, do we have a study that says how many kids are remediated at 80, 90, 100, 120, 140, 160? Um, nobody's done that kind of a longitudinal study. It'd be extremely expensive. And what I mean by that is in our study on measuring the effectiveness of the Now Foundations program um, and measuring the, the way that the Now Foundations could close the gap on kids who are eight to 10 years of age, who are reading at the fifth percentile, um, we only were able to give them a dose of instruction, which was basically 80 sessions. Not because we expect them all to be remediated and done, that's just how far a million dollars would take us with the number of, of kids that we were working with, with the amount of staff it was required to do the testing, deliver the treatment. I'm the person who did all the teacher training in those studies with Joe Torgerson and his FSU group and the Morris Center and myself. Um, and without all that money, we still, I mean, sorry, even with all that money, we couldn't do more than give each kid 80 sessions. So we know that in that model, we did two hours a day, five days a week of one-on-one. -on -one. It helped answer a very important question, which was it just instruction should always be done every day. What we know from both developmental instruction training and from um, stroke rehab, neuro rehabilitation training, daily instruction is part of that proper recipe to build skills as strong as possible, as is a uh, time of intensity, like at least 45 minutes a day, unless we're talking about a you know four or five year old, then it might be 20. But typically you're talking about school age kids, age seven and up, at least 45 minutes a day, always five days a week. So you're trying to get those skills going, get those skills built. And with those skills going on, um, then we have the best chance to begin to close the gap. So in that study, it was two hours a day, five days a week. And the average gain, across the whole group of 30 students, the average gain was from fifth percentile to the 45th percentile in the ability to decode or sound out words. So that was like 22 to 26 standard score points. That's like, you know, standard scores are a mean of 100 and a plus or minus of 15 points. These are kids who are scoring in the 70s on the professional grade uh, decoding testing. And eight weeks later, when we retested them, they're scoring you know, 94, you know, 96, you know, 72 plus 24 is 96. They're smack dab in the average range of function. The real measure of what happens with that improved decoding skills is what happens to their placement in special ed. And in that peer reviewed randomized control trial study, which for those who don't fully understand what that means, it's a 500 page grant. Um, it goes to the NICHD division of NIH, which is the child division of, of NIH, to be vetted by a panel of national experts in literacy. There's 10 other people comp competing against you to get this million dollar funding. And the panel reads all of your research, study, design, uh, how you're going to select people, how you're going to measure them, what you're going to do. And they rank your study based on what they know about the science of dyslexia, the science of reading, the science of learning, you know, all the science of brain development. And the, only the studies that are in the top 3% actually get funded. So our study ranked solidly in the top 3%. It was funded for a million dollars. And But the question was, when we've shown that you can change those skills, what happens one and two years later? That was one of the first studies in the nation to show that we know how to exit children out of special ed. That study, one of its scientific findings was 40% of kids who got that now foundations developmental intervention, 40% of them left special ed. Why? Because they read on grade level. They were in the average range of reading skills. They were no longer impaired in their reading accuracy um, or comprehension. Some were fully strengthened in fluency and some were not. As a group overall, they didn't make huge changes in fluency. And so some people have misinterpreted that data to say, well, you know, you can't change fluency in eight to 10 year olds, it's too late. Well, 
when you do a study like that, and we know it's a study of a developmental disorder, think of it this way. Stephen, if we just taught you how to ride a road bike and you're 40, and we want to put you in a race with other 40-year-olds who've been riding bikes for 20 years. Well, yeah, you both know how to do it, but they have 20 years more practice than you do. So your speed, your automaticity, your skill level is not going to be on par with your peers who have 20 years experience. So it shouldn't surprise people that when we just taught these kids how to read, because they were reading at the fifth percentile, they had no decoding skills. When we took them to the 45th percentile, they know how to do it. They're accurate with it. But it's going to take a range of experience and practice to build that fluency of reading. That same study brought the kids back two years later and showed that now the majority of them now had fluency on par with the decoding skills, and they're all now up there at their IQ level. So that's the other important piece to understand is you might change a skill, what its, its outcome. So that study told us what 80 hours would do. We don't know what 100 hours would do, what 120 hours would do. Speaking not from scientific research, speaking from a, uh, you know, a brain scientist who's now been doing this work since I was, um, gosh, 19 years old, so um, 38 years. Um, in the clinical environment, we know the average is what we're going to tell families is about a conservative average is about 160 hours, plus or minus 20. Might be 140, might be 180. About 90% of individuals of any age who are mild or moderately impaired are going to finish the now foundations program in that level and we're not going to need to do more work and they're going to keep building the skills stronger over time um, but we do have outliers when we look at the whole range we have some students who finish in 80 hours we had one person who was paying for it himself he was 25 years old he's about to go to grad school i'm um, sorry he was just finishing grad school he's about to get his first job uh, in the federal government he's really excited about this job and he knew he's going to have to have better reading skills because he's going to work in the patent office. And so he paid for his own intervention. And let me tell you, he worked his tail off. He made sure the tutors worked every minute of every hour he paid for. He finished it in about 65 hours, which is not typical. But if you're more mildly impaired and you're highly motivated and you're still using the skills outside of the sessions, you're increasing your intensity and your frequency and your level of engagement in the practice all those things are going to make the brain build the skills faster. So anywhere from, you know, as, as low as 55, 65 hours, but it goes as high as 240 hours if there's a severe dyslexia and there's a severe language processing problem and there's moderate to severe ADHD, which doesn't affect our ability to change reading skills. It just makes your learning experience less efficient. So in a 45-minute session, you might get fewer words read, fewer words spelled, fewer words worked on for the phonological processor because you get distracted, get, you know, lose focus. Even when instructors like the ones in the now company are highly trained to redirect you, re-engage you, you know, use joke, use motivation, something funny to keep you focused and keep you engaging. You still are going to be losing some instructional time when the attentional system fluctuates over that instructional hour. Yeah, I mean, this is where the 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 more you practice, the better you get. Yeah. Really comes into practice or comes into play. Yeah. Um, I mean, how many times have we heard that growing up? Right. You know, you have to read to to read better. Yeah. You know, and, once and we to fix that, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, because that statement you said is really important. The more you practice, the better you get. But only if one condition exists, if you have the skills. So right. if you're properly practicing the skills, because you now have phonological awareness and you have decoding skills and your brain is beginning to memorize sight words because you're more easily sounding them out, you now have all these systems working. The practice is going to give you greater gains. We have longitudinal studies of like over five years where you show a small gap at age seven in first grade. If we do nothing to change those foundational the deficits in phonological awareness and decoding skills, we don't change those as soon as possible, that gap's going to be bigger at second grade. And again, do nothing that gets bigger at third, fourth, fifth. And by the time you hit fifth grade, one study showed that your reading comprehension skill at fifth grade will be three and a half grades behind your peers who came to school in first grade with fully developed phonological awareness and early literacy skills already intact, letter name knowledge strong, visual perception skills strong, and you're both getting the same instruction, but their learning curve is steeper because their brain's building the skills more efficiently. 
the child who has deficits, their learning curve is happening, and schools will say to parents, he's making progress. You absolutely do not want to hear that because that means he's falling behind because a flatter line versus a steeper line, two diverging lines over time just get further apart. That's where that three and a half grade gap will happen by fifth grade. Yeah, that, that always just, just kills me that we have, I know our, our educators, our public educators, they want to do the best that they can. And they're trying to uh, teach in just about any method that they can, they can find to help these kids. However, you know, we, we're still dealing with comments like the more you read to your kid, the less they have a chance yeah. of being dyslexic or the more you speak to your kid or the more you, you know, do these things. And, you know, I want to dispel that while there may be uh, some some sprinkles of truth in there, because because we're talking about that um, experience. Right. So the more you're you're engaged in conversation with your child or the more they're they're exposed to those larger words that they, they wouldn't be able to read at this time. Yes, that's where that statement really comes from. But if we don't have the or if we do have the inefficiency in the wiring it doesn't matter how much you read to them how much you talk to them i mean we read to our boys mm -hmm. i say we amy is the part of we that read to our boys all along um and you know we we are constantly talking to our kids and you know they still still have dyslexia yeah know, thanks yeah. to Good old dad. <laughs> and, and dad can blame it on mom or dad, grandparent. Uh, you right. know, genetic runs in families. That's all it is. So um, I know that uh, we were doing just a pop-up uh, video just to get some some conversation going, right? Yeah. And to work out uh, the technology. We probably should tell folks who are watching, yeah, we're not set up for comments right now. We apologize. We're getting to that. We just want to make sure, you know, Steven's in Texas. I'm in Florida. We're testing out the technology with a small group. Um, we've got the form, Stephen. I think you had one or two people who sent in some questions on the form. We'll get to those before we end. Uh, but when we repeat this, we're going to start doing this um, at least once a week. And we'll give you more than two hours notice. No worries. Uh, but we'll be doing this at least once a week. We'll be taking live questions as well. And we want to really engage with families because even that one statement I made early, most families have no idea of this statement's uh, truth, which is, Dr. Sally Shaywitz, one of the pioneers of dyslexia research, says the only caliber of science that parents should be looking for for a dyslexia program is, is the program vetted by randomized controlled trials? There's not a single OG-based program that has any randomized controlled trials. Uh, the Now Foundations program that the Now Company brought to market 11 years ago, we brought it to market because we did three five-year randomized controlled trials, one on remediation, one on prevention, and one on remediation of fluency deficits in elementary school kids. And then we did randomized controlled trials on stroke rehab. There is no other dyslexia program that meets the standard that Sally Shaywitz says every dyslexia program must be meeting the medical grade caliber of proof of efficacy, which means does it work? And so many parents don't understand that. And many parents don't understand that the Department of Education at the federal and state level is using the word evidence-based, but they changed the definition. And that's why Sally Shaywitz, more than 10 years ago, testified to Congress to say the real definition of evidence-based is, was it vetted by a randomized controlled trial? The educational definition of evidence-based is, do a group of people think it works? Well, then it's okay. We'll say that it's evidence-based because that's some evidence. In medicine, we call that anecdotal. You don't want a child to be given a medication that's never been tested by randomized controlled trials for safety, for effectiveness, for proper dosage, because that's using your child as a guinea pig. And that's putting your child at risk. And that's unethical. And if a physician does not use penicillin to treat strep throat when there's no reason not to use it, they just think, you know what, I, I'm a physician. I know chemicals. 
I've studied the chemicals in antibiotics. I've mixed my own concoction. I think I have a better antibiotic. I want you to try this on your child. And, and Stephen, what do we call that? We call that educate, we call that medical malpractice. So in the educational field, if physicians did or any healthcare professional that's required to be evidence-based, if they did the same thing in the medical field that we see happening in education, it would be called educational malpractice and you'd be at risk of losing your license. So we have to make sure people understand they've changed the definition of the same term. That's not to your benefit. You don't want an evidence-based program that does not have randomized controlled trials because that is the gold standard that all healthcare subscribes to because it's the best way to give our children even our teenagers or adults, the most effective program they can get with the best chance for the best possible outcomes. So to recap, dyslexic dyslexia is genetic. Yep. We can remediate it. Yeah. We can remediate you to the point where you will not identify as a dyslexic if tested. Yeah, you won't meet the DSM-5 criteria. You won't meet the, criteria. The, the licensed professional you know, professionally, ethically, it should not be giving you that diagnosis when you don't meet the criteria anymore. Your accuracy, your fluency, and your comprehension are average or above. You do not meet the criteria for that diagnosis. Genetically, yeah, you still have it. You're going to pass it on. But you really shouldn't be characterized as dyslexic based on your reading skills. And just to add to that for the advocacy world, because, yeah. I mean, that's that's my... my uh... Those are my people that I'm out here fighting for is, is the parents to help them understand, number one, what truly is dyslexia? What does it really look like? Two, what does success truly look like when being remediated? Um, what is it? Is your kid going to continue to struggle? Do they are they at grade level? Will they always be below grade level? But the last thing is advocacy and, and making sure that you understand how to fight for your kids yeah. and, and fight for the most appropriate remediation that's possible. And we as parents, as advocates, aren't sitting back going, well, it's better than nothing. Right, right. Because we only have 13 years to get our kids through K-12 or exactly public education. And we have to make sure that we're not wasting any time and our kids have the the best opportunity to become the vet, best version of themselves. Yeah. Um, and they can go on and do whatever type of career that they want to do. Yeah. If they want to go on to a higher education, great. If they want to go ahead and uh, go to a trade school, great yeah. but what we're doing is we're making sure that our kids have a little thing called opportunity yeah and the, the less skills. yeah the skills to choose the opportunity they want to pursue not the opportunity they think they can do correct yeah so a huge the, the better the better our kids have that have uh their reading ability mm -hmm. their comprehension um, the better they're going to be able to uh, make it through life and yeah. and and through their working career. So, yeah. um, you know, I want to I want to thank uh, you, Dr. Conway, for coming on here and helping uh, answer some questions and dispel myths, like I love to do. <laughs> um, you know, our our parents out here uh, are really trying to figure out exactly how to navigate this, yeah. and without really solid information, uh, we tend to um, fall for just about anything because we're wanting to make sure our kids get the help they need. Exactly. So you know, I want to appreciate um, you coming on here and taking your time to to answer some questions. We'll do this uh, again in probably a week. Yep. We'll Most just like continue these that. going on and making sure that our um, our families get their questions answered and, and understand exactly the, the, the best thing is not only to get your questions answered, but to understand what are the right questions to ask yeah. of our school system, right. of our, right. our legislators right. that are making right. these laws, yeah. of our publishers who are making these dyslexia uh, programs, making sure that they aren't just telling us 
whatever sounds good, yeah. we know the right questions to ask yeah. to make sure that we get the best product out there. Exactly. And I want to go ahead and just acknowledge real quick, Stephen, we've got, you know, um, viewers making comments. Um, yes, we're recording this. Um, yes, we'll make it available so you can watch it. You can go back and watch. If you just signed on, no problem. We'll be posting this recording in this private group for now. Um, later, we'll be opening it up to more than just this private group. This was just our technology test run. Uh, we're using a new platform, a new technology. Facebook has made some modifications. Um, we want to do a dry run first before we try to, you know, open to a really large audience and risk a technology failure. We don't want to waste our time or your time. Um, so I, think I, want to, I want to acknowledge one one statement that was here uh, that it saved my daughter's life. Yeah, yeah. So when I go out and I speak to educators, uh, I use that analogy a lot. Yeah. And the fact that what we're doing here is literally saving lives. That job in remediation of, for dyslexia yeah. is as important as any uh, trauma surgeon, ER doctor, because we we know what statistics show when it comes to failure in school, dyslexia in school without being remediated. And we know that it feeds three places. We know that it feeds poverty. Yeah. We know it feeds prison. And we know it feeds the graveyard. Yeah. And anything that we can do to cut off those three pipelines is is um, is what we're going to be doing here. So. Yeah. And Stephen, I think a, a great way to end this tech trial that we just did. Um, and, and again, I'm Dr. Tim Conway, a neuropsychologist. I'm dyslexic, but I got prevention at age five. You know, Stephen has a technology systems engineer background, but had dyslexia and didn't finish high school because of his dyslexia and got remediation with the now company's now foundations program at age 45. Um, so we have a great dialogue and respect for each other because we have the same mission, which is we know how to help intervene early. And we want parents to not waste money on programs that do not have evidence by randomized controlled trials. Those programs typically take three to seven years. Sadly, the bulk of them are OG based programs that they make progress, but they only change decoding, but they don't change fluency. They don't change spelling or it doesn't change expressive receptive language. But the bottom line is, and Sally Shaywitz, who most anybody, as a parent and a dyslexic child or a sibling of a dyslexic adult knows she's one of the premier um, science based um, purveyors of information about dyslexia. She testified to Congress and she says repeatedly, and it's on our website on the Yale dyslexia website, the best caliber of science is randomized controlled trials that gives the parent the best chance to know it's going to be effective. It's going to work and you're not going to keep doing another program after this. And the NOW Foundation's program has three five-year randomized controlled trials. It's the only dyslexia program vetted to that caliber of science. So I think the best way to wrap up and, and end this conversation, Stephen, is for you to give us one story about what happens when you take a 15-year-old who's reading at the 10th percentile, but has above average IQ, and we put them online in that NOW Foundation's program. And for those of you who don't know, we're talking about Stephen's oldest son. I think you should tell that story as our closing conversation. Um, so we, I have three boys, two of which are dyslexic. My middle son was um, diagnosed or identified in third grade, like most most children, or I say a lot of children. Um, and Asher was late identified in seventh grade. Um, we never really saw the same type of struggle uh, um, that we saw with Aiden. However, he Asher was in AP classes. He was in honors classes. So it looked as if, as if he was doing really well. Mm -hmm. But it was really when we got to seventh grade and he hit that wall. When he the compensation skills were no more. He, you know, the work really uh, came down on it. Yeah. And we were like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and get you tested just because we know it's genetic. We know it runs in the family. Chances are 
you're dyslexic. Mm -hmm. So we went ahead and had him tested, came back that he was severely dyslexic. And when I really, when I started going through his FIE, so his initial testing, I was blown away that a child could be that successful and have that many deficits yeah. that were that low. I mean, and, and, there were areas that, that he was in the first percentile. Yeah. And we call that, that's evidence of high IQ because they're compensating like crazy working around the deficits. So immediately Asher was like, I am not doing a remediation program. I've watched my brother go through it. We're not doing that. I don't care. We're like, okay, we agree. We're going to get you some accommodations and we're just going to roll with it because mm -hmm. he's doing rather well. Yeah. He's making progress, right? So um, it wasn't until his freshman, going into his freshman year of high school that uh, Asher and I met Dr. Conway at DFW Airport and they sat together and talked about what dyslexia is and Dr. Conway started showing him the first uh, part of the NOW Foundation's uh, first program. And when we got in the car to leave, Asher looked at me and he goes, Dad, I, I really understood that. It made a lot of sense. I think I want to do this. And for a 15 year old who was adamant that we are not doing any of that stuff, I don't care what you say, to, to come to me and go, hey, I want to do this. I think this is what I want to do. I mean, it's huge in, of in itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, we put him online. Now he was doing th up to three hours a day, but he would wake up at, at 6 a.m. Yeah. He would do a session. He would go to two a days, come back, take a nap, do another session, go back to two a days, and then he would do a third session after he got back. Hmm. You know, Asher likes to uh, rib me because he beat me by one hour. <laughs> I finished the program in 80 hours and he finished it in 79. Um, he finished in the top 10% of his class. Graduate class. And it was a graduation high school class. And then now he's he's got his in his freshman year of college at Charlton State University, where he got an academic scholarship. Yeah. So this is life changing. Yeah. Your kids can do it just like my kid did it. Mm -hmm. This is this is and you'll hear me say this over and over and over. What does success look like? Yeah. What do you expect? Don't talk to me about well, they're making a they're they're moving the bar a little bit. No, no. Yeah. If you're doing this correctly, we will see these type of gains. I've seen it over and over and over. And, and we have randomized controlled trials that tell us on average we're going to take kids from the fifth percentile to the forty-fifth percentile when they're elementary school age and they're severely dyslexic, if we give them the whole sequence of what is called now foundations for speech, language, reading, and spelling. We named the program that because that's the developmental hierarchy. You speak first, you get language skills second with meaning and semantics, you read later, and then last, the spelling. Spelling is about a 10 times more complicated than reading skills are. So it's one of the latter ones to develop. But that's the developmental hierarchy. And again, it meets the criteria that Sally Shaywitz says every dyslexia program should have. The Now Foundations program, we did three five-year randomized controlled trials, not because we had a company to sell it to parents from. We didn't. We were a small clinic called the Morris Center. We had like 10 staff. Um, I was one of the team there. I'm the person who trained all the teachers for that study. And the question was, can you do anything? Believe it or not, one of the senior scientists on that study said, I don't know why NICHD is giving us this money anyway. You can't change dyslexic kids' reading skills. It doesn't change. Because he was a man in his 40s and 50s, and his experience, he'd never seen dyslexics, phonological awareness, and reading skills become markedly better. 
he had to eat his words because when you show that the average gain was fifth percentile to 45th and that 40% of those kids exited special ed, there's no question that the problem is not the child's brain. The problem's been we've not been giving them randomized control trial tested methods. And let me add one caveat. People are really big on the science of reading today. Um, it's not going to change literacy. And here's why. The science of reading, for all those who bake, my first cake I ever baked was a daffodil cake at age 10. So I'm going to call this the science of reading is a daffodil cake. A science of reading is the list of ingredients for how to bake the daffodil cake. It's flour, it's eggs, it's egg whites, and you separate them. You do all these things to get this beautiful you know, color of yellow and white in the sponge cake. But the science of reading means we're not going to give you the recipe. We're not going to teach you what Betty Crocker figured out is you do this step first, this step second for this long. Oh, and we're also not going to give you the amounts of what goes with each ingredient. Why anybody would think that if I just tell you the ingredients of a cake but give you no recipe and no directions, why do I would I think that everyone using those ingredients is going to get the same outcome? It's absurd. It's not going to happen. You must have the ingredients and the recipe together. And that's what the hallmark is of a randomized controlled trial studied treatment program. It lists both. And that means the results are replicable across the world for any kid anywhere who has that same level of dyslexia and has no other neurological problems. It's just the genetic reading problem. So we want families to expect more, raise the bar because research has already proven the human brain can do more if you give it the right instruction, the right impact, and the right ability to change these skills. Then they go on and live their life without accommodations, without supports, and without the self-esteem you know, fight of always trying to believe that I'm still just as good as somebody else, even though I can't spell well, even though I can't read well. And there's a lot more to talk about this topic and I better stop because you'll get I'll get going again about this group called Made by Dyslexia, who's perpetuating a lot of myths that aren't scientific. So we should save that one for next week, Stephen. Uh, I got I got some doozies for you next week. I'm gonna try to stump you next week. <laughs> All right, I love so, it. So y'all want to y'all want to watch me stump Dr. Conway? <laughs> make sure that you're ready for next week. We'll announce it by Monday. What the time's gonna be? What the date's gonna be? And we're gonna aim to do an evening show and a lunchtime show. Uh, because that way we get the chance to meet the most folks because folks work, folks are busy. We're hoping that lunch and you know early dinner is, are times when you've got some flex in your schedule. And we would then we'll be able to take some questions, earlier questions, earlier comments. Um, all the folks who are on tonight who you know spent time viewing us, commented on us. If you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one call, not a problem. You just email Candace at nowprograms.com. And it's C-A-N-D-I-C-E, Candice at nowprograms.com. Tell her that I promised I would do some one-on-one, -on -one, you know, calls gratis, no charge with anybody who sat in tonight and gave us an audience so we could help test this out. Uh, happy to do that. Happy to learn about your child. See if there's anything else we can do to help. There's also families on here. Like one of them is, you know, Aubrey's mom. Aubrey's Journey has a great Facebook page sharing what happened to Aubrey when she came to a medical clinic called the Morris Center, where we can work on multiple skills at the same time. You change visual skills and motor skills and language skills and literacy skills and comprehension skills. There's so much you can change when you have a big team. So we'll save that for next week. And we appreciate everybody being on with us. And yes, this is recorded. It'll be made available to you. You can rewatch it again and again. I don't know that it'll be shareable yet, but we certainly will work to make that happen soon. Um, we're aiming more to make the shareable ones the ones that we pick up next week going forward. But they'll be available in this private group. If you have a friend you want to watch it, tell them to join the group. We'll make it available here first. Sounds good. Well, again, thank you all for uh, joining us, and we'll see you next week. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.